The human spine is quite the intricate and remarkable structure, but we actually ask a lot of our spine. We ask it to transmit forces and provide structure and stability. We ask it to protect the spinal cord. We ask it to move in all three planes of space. And by the way, spine, while you're providing all these functions, could you please never get damaged or injured? I say that last part a little sarcastically because with all the demands that we place on the spine, it's no wonder that almost everyone experiences some sort of back pain at some point in their life. Some of that back pain can be mild and annoying, all the way up to completely debilitating. So today, we're gonna to talk about the most common causes of back pain, which will include things like throwing out your back with a muscle strain, bulging discs and sciatica, and even degenerative changes that can come along with aging. Plus, we'll discuss some of the things that you can do to help prevent and fix some of these back problems. It's going to be a vertebral one. So let's jump into this anatomical awesomeness. So let me start with some important anatomy of the spine because this will help us to better understand the different types of back pain. The spine, also referred to as the vertebral column, is made up of 33 individual bones called vertebrae. And these can be further divided into five regions, starting superiorly, or at the top, we have the cervical region or the neck, which is made up of seven vertebrae. Then we have the thoracic region associated with your chest and rib cage, that has 12 vertebrae. Then the lumbar region made up of five vertebrae and the sacral region that actually started as five individual bones or vertebrae that fused together in adulthood to form the bone down here that we call the sacrum. And finally, the coccygeal region. And for most people, this started as three to five individual bones. Most of us have four, but these also fused together during adulthood to form one bone called the coccyx or the tailbone. The spine is also surrounded by multiple muscles that attach to and move the spine, like a major muscle group called the erector spiny muscles that you can see here. And of course, we can't forget the intervertebral discs, and most people just refer to them as discs located between the vertebrae. These act like little shock absorbing fibrocartilage pads, and you can actually see the artificial one here on Cornelius, plus the nerve represented here, which that nerve will be important soon. And also we can see some cool real discs on this sagittal section here, 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 and all the way up the spine. But now that you know some of the important anatomy of the spine, we can apply this to back pain because things can go wrong with the bones, muscles, ligaments, discs, and even the nerves. Now, one other thing I do wanna mention is that in rare cases, back pain can be a red flag or from something more serious like cancer, infection, or referred pain from an organ. But today, we're going to focus on the common, non-life-threatening forms of back pain. And remember, factors like age, obesity, smoking, and sedentary lifestyles can crank up the risk of back pain. So let's start with the first type of back pain. The most frequent cause of back pain is a muscle strain or ligament sprain, accounting for a huge chunk of acute cases. Think a sudden onset of pain that hits after a weekend of yard work or a bad night's sleep. This happens when the soft tissues supporting your spine get overstretched, torn, or strained. Imagine lifting a heavy grocery bag with a twist or slouching at your computer for hours. The muscles and ligaments can't handle the stress and kind of start to rebel with pain. And so if we take a look at this cadaver dissection, you can again see the muscle group I referenced earlier called the erector spiny muscles. And just to help orient you a little bit further, this is the right side of the back, and we've removed some familiar muscles like the trapezius or traps and the latissimus dorsi or lats. And there are these long muscles underneath that we said are the erector spiny muscles. But for you anatomy nerds that like more details, the erector spiny muscles can be broken down into three individual muscles called the iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. And many students will use a mnemonic to help them remember the names of these muscles. Some students like the mnemonic, I love school. The I for iliocostalis, the L for longissimus, and the S for spinalis. But most students prefer the other mnemonic, I love sex. For some reason, they remember that one better. And they are the erectors after all. But I digress here. And so you can see these muscles run parallel to the spine and they keep you upright or in erect or extended position. Ligaments such as the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments connect the vertebrae and also limit excessive movement. And when they get strained, tiny tears occur causing swelling and pain signals from nociceptors, which are the pain sensing receptors. But why does this happen so often? Well, poor posture is a big one. Forward leaning head, rounding of the shoulders and slouching weaken the back over time. 
Sudden movements like slipping on ice or repetitive stress from certain jobs can also amp up the risk. And if you're not active, the erector muscles and other muscles like the rectus abdominis, obliques, and glutes don't support the spine well, making strains more likely. In younger individuals under 50, this is the top cause, but it can affect anyone. And the symptoms typically include sharp pain in the lower back that's worse with bending or lifting, plus stiffness and spasms that make you guard your movements. It might radiate to the buttocks, but usually it stays localized. The good news is that this type of back pain often heals in four to six weeks, sometimes sooner. But ignoring it can lead to chronic issues, and we'll get into the treatment protocols a little bit later on. But real quick, let's talk about supporting our spines when we do have to sit with this awesome gaming chair from the sponsor of today's video and a seat. Now I'm personally not much of a gamer, but this chair is designed to be so much more than just a gaming chair. You can use it when you're studying, working, and of course, prepping for YouTube videos. And who wouldn't want to have a chair that's comfortable and supportive while completing those tasks? You can essentially customize this chair to fit your own body. With its integrated lumbar system, you can adjust where the lumbar support is by moving it up or down and adjust how much it pops out, giving you support for your natural spinal curvatures. In anatomy land, we call that the lordotic curve. The 6D armrests also adjust in all sorts of different directions, allowing you to put your arms in the most comfortable position. And of course, you can adjust the recline, the rocker sensitivity, and obviously the height. And let's not forget about the magnetic pillow. This allows for 20 centimeters of adjustment up and down and is made of memory foam to conform to your head and neck. The quality of this chair is incredible and you can get it in multiple colors, some in leather and some in linen, depending on your preference. So best try Andesi by going to the link in the description and use our coupon code IOHA to get $30 off. And now let's get back to back pain. So let's move on to herniated or bulging discs which cause about 20 to 30% of back pain cases. Now, I already mentioned that the discs are found between the vertebral bones that you can again see on this cadaver dissection. But let me give you a little bit more info about the discs. If you look at the anatomy of a disc, you'll see that the center of the disc is made up of this gel-like shock absorbing center called the nucleus pulposus. And surrounding the nucleus pulposus is the outer fibrous ring consisting of fibril cartilage called the annulus fibrosus which keeps the nucleus contained within the center of the disc. And so on this cadaver dissection, this area would be about where the nucleus pulposus is with the surrounding annulus fibrosus. The outer annulus can weaken from age, wear and tear, and or trauma. And when the annulus is weakened or damaged, this will let the inner nucleus pulposus push out, resulting in a bulging or herniated disc. If the herniation is large enough and in the right direction, or I guess you could say in the wrong direction, it can compress the spinal nerve roots. And so this is where you kind of get that double whammy. Not only do you have damage to the disc itself, which can cause pain, but now you can also get the nerve pain from the nerve root compression. And this can technically happen at any spinal level where there is a disc, but most commonly it happens in the lower lumbar discs like between L4 and L5 or between L5 and S1. And this is where sciatica comes in. Sciatica is a set of symptoms that occur when one of the nerve roots contributing to the sciatic nerve gets compressed and irritated. And there are five spinal nerve roots that contribute to the sciatic nerve. L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. And so having five spinal nerve roots contributing to this nerve means this nerve is huge. The largest nerve in the human body. I mean, look at this nerve that you can see just underneath the hamstrings. And just above the knee, the sciatic nerve branches. One branch wraps around to the front of the lower leg into the top of the foot. And this is called the common peroneal nerve. And the other branch, called the tibial nerve, continues straight down the back of the lower leg and to the bottom of the foot. The sciatic nerve and its branches contain both motor neurons that control muscles and sensory neurons that bring in sensation. And so this can help us understand the symptoms of sciatica. Sciatica can cause shooting pain from the back, down through the hip, butt, thigh, lower leg, and even down into the foot. It can also include numbness and tingling due to the compression of those sensory neurons and weakness due to the compression of the motor neurons. The exact location of the numbness and tingling and the exact muscles that are weakened depend on which nerve root that is contributing to the sciatic nerve gets compressed. 
right? Compression of the L4 nerve root would be different than compression of the S1 nerve root. And what is really interesting is a good clinician can actually get a pretty good idea on what spinal nerve root is being affected without even getting an MRI because we've mapped out the areas of the skin that are innervated by certain spinal levels, as well as know what spinal levels contribute to certain muscles. But what are some of the risk factors and causes for developing a herniated disc and possibly sciatica? Well, aging dries out discs, making them brittle, obesity adds pressure, smoking actually reduces nutrient flow to discs, poor ergonomics can play a role like sitting in poor positions all day at work, and obviously injury from sports and improper lifting mechanics, which we'll also talk about lifting mechanics when we get into treatment and prevention of back pain. But well, let's get to the last cause of back pain that we'll talk about today, and that's good old fashioned degenerative changes like osteoarthritis and disc degeneration. This unfortunately affects over 50% of people over the age of 60, but can start earlier in some, especially those that have suffered injuries to the spine. And this spine that we've been looking at throughout this video has some major degenerative changes, especially in the thoracic spine. If you look at the discs, some of them are almost completely worn out. You can't even really make them out. And if you look at the bones, the bones are also worn out or have these wedge shapes. You can't even really make them out. Like look at this one and you look at that one. But if you look down here, this is what the vertebral bodies are supposed to look like. More like this square shaped body, not this wedge shape or degenerative bone that you're seeing in the thoracic spine of this body. Now, some of this was likely due to this female body having osteoporosis. It definitely decreased her height and cause kyphosis, which creates the humpback appearance. People can also get osteoarthritis in these small joints between the vertebral bones here, and these are called facet joints. And what can happen is that cartilage within the joint erodes and can cause pain. Now, some of these degenerative changes can unfortunately just come with aging, and other conditions can contribute like osteoporosis. But is there anything we can do to slow, prevent, or treat these degenerative changes? plus prevent the two forms of back pain that we talked about earlier, like muscle strains and disc issues. Well, of course there is. Preventing yourself from getting back pain in the first place would be the ideal situation. And although you don't have 100% control over this, here are some things that you can do that will help. Maintaining a healthy weight will put less pressure and wear and tear on the spine. Also, if you do have a desk job, make sure you have a supportive chair with good lumbar support to maintain the natural curve of your low back as well as adjustable height so that your feet can rest flat on the floor and your thighs can be parallel to the ground. Keep your monitor directly in front of you at eye level and about arm's length away so you don't have to be constantly looking down which could obviously strain your neck. And if you can, pair this with an adjustable desk that allows you to stand for periods throughout the day. You're going to have the best of both worlds in that situation. But if you can't get an adjustable desk, see if you can incorporate standing or walking around into your work routine. Now I have had many patients come in with back pain due to a lifting injury. So if you do have to lift heavy objects for work or as part of your exercise routine, you need to lift with proper mechanics. And a very effective way of doing this is with the breathe and brace method. What you would do is take a deep breath in and brace and then lower down to pick up the object. But don't let all of your air out when you're down at the bottom. Continue to brace until you lift the object and then you can breathe out through pursed lips at the top. Breathing and bracing is kind of like what you would do if you knew somebody was going to come up and punch you in the stomach. You would naturally breathe in quickly and brace your core muscles, and this really works to stabilize your lumbopelvic region and prevent low back injuries. And although sometimes improper lifting mechanics during exercise can cause back pain, there are also many exercises that can be used to prevent back injuries and even be part of the treatment protocol for back injuries that have already occurred. I can't tell you how many people I know that are actually very consistent with exercise, but neglect core exercises. I personally do resistance training three times a week, and I've made it a goal to not finish the workout without doing some core work. So at the end of every workout, just give yourself an extra five to 10 minutes to complete these exercises. This could include plank or plank variations to help strengthen the obliques and transversus abdominis, and extensor exercises like supermans or back extensions. And also include mobility work for the spine. You want good mobility in all three planes of space, front to back, side to side, and then even those rotational movements. This often naturally happens in yoga and Pilates classes, 
but you can also incorporate this into that five to 10 minutes at the end of your gym routine. But we do have to mention some other muscle groups that can also contribute to back pain, such as the hip flexors like the psoas major and the iliacus, sometimes pronounced iliacus, but iliacus is way more fun to say, as well as some posterior chain muscles like the hamstrings and the glutes. And even though these muscles mobilize a joint in the lower limb, the hip joint, because of their attachments to the spine and the pelvis, they can influence back pain and even sometimes alter the natural curvature of the spine. We tend to sit a lot. And yes, sometimes it is required for us to sit. And during those situations, we do want to have a good desk setup like we talked about earlier. But when you are sitting, your hips are held in a flex position. This can lead to shortened or tight hip flexors, and it can sometimes even result in dysfunctional glutes, meaning the glutes may not always fire or activate properly. So what are some effective exercises to help with this? Well, for the hip flexors, one of my favorite exercises is the split squat. These have been very popularized by Ben Patrick, AKA the knees over toes guy, and for good reason. They are very effective for not only strengthening and increasing the mobility of the front leg, but with the back leg, it will also lengthen and strengthen those tight hip flexors. You can see from this that if you're less mobile like me, you can elevate the front leg, and as you improve your mobility, you can lower the front leg. Plus, you can add resistance as you get stronger. For the hamstrings, I love RDLs, AKA Romanian deadlifts. And this is for the same reason. You're strengthening the hamstrings in a lengthened position. Now, you don't have to be some power lifter to get the benefits of RDLs. Granted, as long as you have proper mechanics, you can put a lot of load on that bar, but even lighter loads can be very beneficial. Plus, you'll also strengthen your back extensors. And finally, to get the glutes firing properly again, hip thrusts or shoulder bridges are great to wake up and strengthen these muscles. Now, you probably wouldn't be able to fit these exercises into that five to 10 minute period that we were talking about with the core exercises. So instead, these would be good to incorporate as exercises into your lower body resistance training, ideally at least two times a week. But hopefully that gives you some exercises that you can start with, and hopefully you learn some interesting information about the human spine and back pain. Thank you for watching and supporting our channel, and we'll see you in the next video.